Hi, it's Paul Steckler sitting at the same desk where I've been teaching online for the last 15 months. I'm here to welcome you to the advanced documentary screening for the spring. Um, I want to thank my TA Sachin, uh, who was my teaching assistant for an entire year and was just fabulous. As always, I want to thank all of the um, technical staff, Keith, Suzanne, Jeremy, Kai, everyone who helps fix the equipment, all the folks in equipment check, check out, and also uh, my RTF staff and faculty colleagues who I'm all looking forward to seeing in person in the fall, and of course all the support we get from our chair, Noah Eisenberg, our production area head, Stuart Kelvin, our graduate advisor, Mikel Alvarez, and our dean, Jay Bernhardt. Stick around afterwards, um, I think you'll see the a link for the question and answer and all our filmmakers and hopefully all the people in the films will stick around as well. So enjoy the show and um, I'll see you right afterwards. Bye bye. My name is Jordan and I'm a junior in college. So this is college. When I came into college, I knew exactly what I was getting into. I knew exactly what sorority I was going to go. I knew I was going to get a bid from them and I had the rush process down to a T. My name is Ema and I'm a sophomore at college. So prior to the rush experience and joining a sorority, I wanted to look a certain way. She spent hours trying to make herself more attractive. You know, I've read blogs about what you're supposed to do prior to Rush. Learn how to do your makeup. I had a friend help me pick out outfits. I went from basketball shorts and a t-shirt to Lululemon leggings and a nice blouse. My name is Adina and I'm a junior here in college. I'm, I'm very Jewish and it's a huge part of my life. So I kind of had this expectation coming in that like I, I really wanted to be in the Jewish sorority, that I really wanted it and I was really afraid that like they weren't gonna have room for me or that they weren't gonna like me and so that I wasn't going to necessarily like fit in anywhere really and so that was probably my biggest fear. When you get to a house during rush, you line up outside and when they first open the doors, there's typically a door stack or a chant. They're kind of screaming at you and it's really overwhelming. But then you walk into the house and it is probably 100 to 200 people in one room screaming over each other, trying to have just the most basic conversation you've ever had in your life. So during these conversations, it's okay to mention you have a boyfriend and stuff, but for me, it felt safer to not mention it. It's a first impression, so I just didn't necessarily want to share that right then because I wanted to get an invitation back to another day and eventually to bid day getting a bid. After the first round, I was cut from every house, but the Jewish one and that to me was really, really scary. Was I cut because they were like, oh, she's gonna go to the Jewish sorority or because they did not want me because I was very Jewish? I'm talking about the fact that you're Jewish. You must make friends among your own kind. There were some kind of comments that were made, like it's very clearly obvious that I'm Jewish. I'm you know, wearing Jewish jewelry. It's a Jewish bracelet. When they figure out that you're Jewish, their kind of whole vibe changes. Are you crazy? What's the matter? What's the matter? It's a Jewish star, he told you. What sororities were, were founded on was, you know, straight Christian ideologies. And so that kind of 
attitude has carried on throughout history. And even though they've kind of shifted and changed and they're working towards being diverse and inclusive, I, that attitude kind of has not changed in terms of like Jewish women going through the process. In order to get a bid to my sorority, I put in next to no effort. I knew I was gonna get a bid because I have two older sisters that are in the sorority that I ended up joining. I would get the best spots in the room and I'd get the best seats when we watched the videos and it was, it was pretty ridiculous actually. On bid day, you had to wait all day and you were sitting on an envelope that had the bid that you were gonna get. And you open it up, all the girls are opening up at the same time and you've prepped one specific sorority in particular. So it's very nerve wracking to see if you got that specific one. Once you see your bid, you all run to your sorority house. I would describe what it looks like very similar to if a bomb had just exploded. People are scattering, they're running so fast in all different directions. It is so chaotic. You have to see it to believe it. I was so excited when I got my bid and when I ran home. I think it's really different when you run home and you see people you already know. I immediately felt at home because I was in this safe haven for Jewish women. When I first opened my bid, I wasn't surprised because as I said, I knew what I was getting from the beginning. For me, I did get the sorority that I prepped and I was so happy once I got it. It was like, yes, I won. I did what I wanted to do, but now it's like the hard part begins. I still have not told them. Actually, I'm a lesbian. I have a girlfriend. During your first year in the sorority, you have what's called mixers with different fraternities, and that's where your pledge class of your sorority meets with the pledge class of a different fraternity. The alcohol travels down the esophagus. The expectation is that you're going to meet guys and just kind of like get as drunk as possible. Some of it reaches the brain, and because of this may provide an illusion of relaxation. When there's alcohol present at a mixer, I definitely get a feeling that when I'm with fraternity members sometimes that they're not there to make friends. They'll want my number. How about a kiss? And at some point I'll have to be like, actually I'm a lesbian. And suddenly it's like, blocked. Some of the non-Jewish fraternities did not want to mix with us and they did not make it very clear. It was kind of very subtle. Um, we had a mixer scheduled with a fraternity and they told us that they had double booked us with a, another sorority and they were like, well, we don't want to mix with you guys. And the way they said it, it was kind of subtly hinted like, you're the Jewish sorority. Like, we don't really want to mix with you. The reality of it is that most of the time, you just make out with some random guy at the party and then you like never see him again, or you pray that you never see him again. <laughs> it all starts with knowing whether you're going or not, and with whom. In a sorority, we have date events, and during those, you're expected to bring a date. Do I bring a male best friend? Do I bring my girlfriend? There's fear there. I do feel like sooner or later, I'm going to have to say something. I'm going to eventually want to invite my girlfriend to a date event. And that's going to be a moment where I realize and I discover if my fears are real or not. To be determined. <laughs> if you are going to give a party, plan that party around a purpose. For fraternity parties, typically, the whole point is just to get as many girls there as possible. You know, all of us went to this Jewish fraternity, and so we met all the Jewish guys like that night. So it's kind of like this instant connection, like they want you to meet the other people in our community kind of that are also in Greek life and see like that side of, you know, what's happening. So I have had a negative experience at a fraternity party. Um, I was just dancing with all of my friends and um, I guess I got pulled away and was assaulted in the party room at a fraternity on campus. It was dark, it was loud, and I was so drunk I have no idea who it was. I don't even know if he goes to our school. And then I was just away from the scene. And um, some friends came and picked me up, but then they actually, <laughs> they left me in their apartment and went and slept over at their boyfriend's house while I was alone in their apartment. This really made me question what sisterhood and sororities was supposed to mean. Like, going into this, I expect when bad things to happen to you, you want your friends to stand up for you and to 
be there for you. But in this instance, I was by myself and I was abandoned and alone. And it made me wonder, what am I doing? Why am I here? Like, what, what is a sorority supposed to be if it doesn't do these things I expected? I think sororities will always carry the traditional aspect with them. But I feel like we are moving in the right direction. And even though I haven't come out yet, I feel like by senior year, I should and I definitely will. Um, I, I do think that the sororities and Greek life and the fraternities, like there is this ability to change and to be more aware of the issue. You know, the way that they act around like the Jewish sorority and the fraternities is because they don't know, because they're not necessarily educated on the topics. But I do think that there is ability to change if we make people aware of the issue. I think Greek life is a like hub of privilege and essentially that breeds people with the mindset of I can do whatever I want. But it also, it does help make a big university a lot smaller. Helps you make small friend groups, it gives you more to do, it sets an agenda for you. I think Greek life is a good thing. I just think that there's a lot of things that need to be worked on. I think the point of a sorority is sisterhood and those are why they were founded and that's why they still exist today is because people are looking for a place to belong. Honey, ¿quieres su honey? ¿Para que deje de temblar? Chaparriongo. Ahorita nos estamos preparando para, para poner todos los ingredientes que vamos a utilizar para el video. Cuando ya se dieron mis dos semanas de noticia, como mesera, se vino la pandemia. Entonces, cuando yo salí, ya no pude encontrar trabajo. ¿Y por qué andas en calzones nada más? Ve, ponte pantalones, no un short. Pantalones, Ay, no te hagas. Wey. Pues lávalo, no te hagas, ¿eh? Ay, Me empecé a entretener con, con YouTube. Como soy amante de la comida, es muy placentero para mí ver mm. comida y cómo la preparan y cómo mm. se la comen. He pensado hacer algo similar. Action. Hola amigos, ¿cómo estamos? Ahora vamos a hacer un delicioso mole poblano. ¿Y quién creen que lo va a probar? Roger, the destroyer. Chile, verde, tortillas, sal de ajo. No, espérate, ya me equivoqué. Espero que uh, uh, tenga espectadores que les gusten mis videos para que yo pueda tener un cheque. Estamos preparando el plato para to hacer la toma y ya este es el último paso que tengo. Él es el mi probador oficial. ¿Es mío? Sí, sí, Cani. Espera, wait, wait, Roger, until I say um, action, you start to move. Tu papá es... Es una persona este, muy cambiante en, en su personalidad. Este, la principal en, el, en los videos voy a ser yo. Él es el que va, va a grabar y va a entrar dentro de los videos también. I had this idea flash in my head of a cowboy who uh, went back to his house and got off his horse. I thought maybe a, a caricature person could make like a caricature of me and Angie. Your mom's definitely going to be the straight man. I'm definitely not going to be the straight man <laughs> because I like to have fun, you know. And anytime we, it gets heated between us, I just tell her, uh, we're supposed to be having fun. We'll see how it goes. I mean, we could do this for the rest of our lives together and that'd be just fine with me. 
A ver, déjame ponerte el queso porque eres capaz de meter tus manos y te apuesto que, que no te las has lavado. No, ¿Qué? Están limpios. Están limpios y te estoy viendo que te agarran los tanates. Toma, toma. Te voy a dar con la chancla. Ok. Hasta la vista, tripié. Lo principal es que divertirme, especialmente porque todo tipo de trabajo es, es estresante, se podría decir. Y el estrés no es bueno. Entonces yo quisiera que, que si yo empiezo a trabajar en un canal en las cosas que a mí me gusta hacer, como comer, eso me desestresa. Y a lo mejor me ponga más gorda. Joey es, bueno, él es un ADHD, pero es muy activo, muy juguetón, no toma las cosas en serio. Sometimes, but not often. Like I hold the camera. Yeah but she doesn't trust me with it anymore, so. Why? She's afraid I'd drop it. You think you drop it? Yeah. <laughs> Brian, él es un niño muy calmado. Este es, es sumamente inteligente. Oh, I can't. <laughs> Why? Have you seen any of mom's uh, videos? No. I don't even know what her channel name is. Short, put a short. Así se escribe, ¿verdad? Uh, ¿Cómo lo escribes? ¿Con sí. H? No, ¿SH? Es S. ¿Ese? Es uh -huh. Eso lo quiero borrar, pero no sé cómo. ¿Y por qué me sale la pantalla chica? Tú eres una niña muy inteligente, muy responsable. Yo no tengo queja de ti porque tú has sido para mí mi asistente, mi copilota. Me ha apoyado mucho en ti más que en, en, tu, en mi pareja. Eres una gran bendición para mí. The only small kitchen I had in my life was in Mexico. We bought this house. This is the one you like. And now yeah. you complain. No, the I, I just small. don't have so many cabinets to put them on. You picked of this house. You shut up. Daddy bought her a house with a small kitchen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Si me caigo, me levanta. Ay. ¿Cómo me gusta? ¡Ah! Sí. Mi turno. Mi turno. Okay, that's good. That's what it's going Thank to you be. very much, señor. No problem. My price is 250 dollars. Let me tell you, you would be rich. Tonight. Unless you want to make some other arrangements. Ah, that's why I'm telling you, I'll pay you tonight. <laughs> Or tomorrow. Cash. Tomorrow. Cash. <laughs> Mi childhood fue, fue buena, fui feliz, aunque mi familia también fue disfuncional porque mi papá tenía problemas de alcoholismo. Este, mi mamá era una persona muy fuerte porque nosotros fuimos ocho hermanos y ella tenía que hacerse cargo de todo. Teníamos este 
devaluación de en el peso en México y, y, y había recesión. Entonces no podía encontrar trabajo y es cuando decidí venirme a Estados Unidos. Y como no tenía seguro social, tenía que hacer trabajos los más mal pagados. Me metí a, a housekeeping, este, era duro. Después me fui a um, trabajar a, um, a una fábrica. Ya que estuve trabajando de mesera, um, seguí siendo mesera porque fue lo que más me pagó sin, sin tener una carrera aquí en los Estados Unidos. ¿Te duele tanto? ¿Tienes tu...? No, no traigo la faja. <risa> He grabado acerca como seis videos. He editado uno, pero como ves, yo estoy aprendiendo. Mis próximos planes del video es de comida local, de aquí de, del área donde yo vivo. You want 8 ounce, 12 ounce, 16 ounce? The small one. The small one? Yeah. No. Okay. But you iron your clothes, but not my clothes. Why you iron yourself? I had to iron my Why own clothes. Why I had clothes. to iron your clothes? Can you believe it? Honey, it's not the same as before. When the wife iron to the to the their men. It's not like in the beginning when I met you and I tried to teach you English and I tell you, okay, say this. I will wash your clothes. And then I teach you, I will make your food. And you said it. Now, Rogelio, do this, do that. Roger, tonto, why are you doing that? This I made for your mom. It's a dream hat. Uh, you're gonna be making films. We got you a director's chair. At the same place, we got another camera bag. It's nice, it has all these compartments, and it comes with a camera. Five bucks. Vamos a ir a comer. Barbecue. Me preocupa que la comida esté buena. La pila está llena, tengo otra pila llena. El SIM card. Joey, I'm calling you. Thank you, mijo, I love you. Oh my God. Joey. Joy, yes. come over here. I need your help. Préstame tus audífonos. What? Sí. No, I can't hear you. What? Préstame tus audífonos. What? Why? Los necesito para usarlo con mi cámara. Luego te los traigo. No. Los necesito ahora. Y te voy a contar tres porque ya me tengo que ir. This is me going to go. have another one. Usa el otro. Tráemelos, pues. Tra I don't know where they are, though. Like we say, hey, hello, I'm, I'm me, it's me, Angelica, y el gringo, gracias, mijo. Thank you. Oh, where is the bag? Did you put it away? Hola, ¿qué tal, amigos? Soy yo, Angelica, y él... Y el gringo. <laughs> ok, los vamos a invitar a comer una deliciosa Muy comida. Muy deliciosa. Barbecue Tex-Mex. Ok, vienen con nosotros. Sale, bye. Tengo hambre. <laughs> gotta bring this food to our children. <laughs> Come to No fue bien para hacer el primer video. Este, vamos a ver, me tengo que poner un poquito más de acuerdo con tu papá porque se supone que él es el, el cameraman, pero se le olvidó, yo creo. Three, two, one. <risa> 
Estoy aprendiendo a hacer las tomas y así me puedo dar cuenta de que de cuáles son mis errores, ¿sí? Do you need somebody go with you? Uh, maybe. Do you have money? I have fifteen dollars. Okay, you say that. Why do you need a table? For my little computer. Because I get mom the office. Y la ves, como por ejemplo, voy caminando y hago el movimiento muy rápido. Y hasta que me... Una de mis amigas me, me recomendó para una entrevista de trabajo. Estuve pensando acerca del trabajo, qué es realmente lo que yo quería hacer. Decidí rechazar la oferta de trabajo para poder continuar con mi proyecto de, del... YouTube Chana. ¡Dámelo! ¿Y vas a perderlo otra vez? ¡Dámelo! ¡Chanito! ¡Chanito! ¡Mis on TV! Yo empecé a cocinar comida japonesa cuando me casé con tu papá. Casi siempre él la hacía la primera vez y ya después yo seguía la segunda vez. Pero casi siempre éramos así. Yo le ayudaba a cortar algo y él preparaba otra cosa. Y entre plática y cocinando, se nos iba rápido ese rato ahí. Sí, 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 nos agarramos los dos porque él opina una y sí, yo me agarro también con él porque él me quiere hacer que no se hace así cuando él me enseñó así y ahora me quiere cambiar que ya no se hace así. Pero no, tía, a mí me salen muchas comidas mucho más ricas que él. <risa> Tenía 16 años cuando entré a trabajar y era en Piedras Negras. Era compañía japonesa y ahí fue donde nos conocimos. Duramos platicando un año y ya después nos hicimos novios. A los 17 años ya me pidió matrimonio y a los 18 nos casamos cuando yo tenía 18 años. De primero, cuando él me mandaba recados o así, pues no, yo lo ignoraba porque pues yo decía, ¿cómo yo con un, con un asiático? Yo pensaba que era como que, ay, no, este está jugando. Este, no lo tomé en serio. Y así quedó, se nos pasó bastante tiempo hasta que él siguió mandándome recados y todo. Y ya después empezamos a platicar. Mira, te enseño la foto cuando estábamos haciendo el brindis. Obvio que tu papá rápido se lo acabó, pero obvio que los zapatos, fascinada con los zapatos. Aquí el primer beso antes de entrar a la iglesia. It is my, not my favor to see a Mexican lady. I was thinking to get married a Japanese lady, but uh, only her made me, make, made me My mind changed because uh, she was so impressive, beautiful. That time, yeah, I thought that at 28, I have learned everything. So I was uh, uh, focusing on to go to next step, but uh, I said, oh, I'm not going to, I was not going to find anything anymore in Mexico. 
uh, I should go back to Japan. I changed completely my mind to stay in Mexico because of her. Yeah, even, even I don't understand why. I fell in love with her. Just only one star, uh, all of a sudden, show up in, in front of me and so bright, so bright, bright for me. Otra gente se sorprendía al ver que tú tenías niñas que no se parecían a, a, a los demás. ¿A ti te caía mal? Sí, oh. Siempre me decían que si yo estaba casada con un chino. Uh -huh. O sea, siempre era esa pregunta que me hacía. En esos tiempos no te molestaba que consideraran a papi chino, sí. aunque no era chino. ¿A ti te molestaría? Si alguien, te si alguien te pregunta a ti, ah, ¿eres china? Lo, yo fuera... Tú si sí le, fuera, le, fuera, le fuera dicho soy japonesa. O soy japonesa. japonesa. Gente de, de Latinoamérica siempre han dicho como que casi todos los asiáticos son chinos. Uh -huh. Ahora, ¿cómo vamos a cambiar eso si nosotras no vamos a estar empezando a corregir la, la gente, gente? ¿Sabes? Uh -huh. Porque si no... Do I like being mixed? Growing up, no, but why? Why are you doing that? I'm surprised to hear that response, but go ahead. Yeah, so when I was younger, a lot of little kids would pick on me, but now mm -hmm. I've learned to embrace both parts of my yeah. culture. Yeah. Were you ever picked on like you? I don't think I was ever picked on for how I looked. When were you picked on? Like, what was there a time frame? Uh, like, do you think it was like people? Well, I remember specifically being in that class during like a musical, and uh, they put like all the little colored girls in like one the backup backup dancers for this musical, mm -hmm. and all the leading parts were like the little white girls that mm. uh, were there. That's not necessarily me being picked on, but uh, that's like... Like you were put in a group? Yeah, yeah, like looking back at it now, I'm like, dang, that was racist. Yeah. That's hell, or that's like very... Uh, that's just wrong, yeah. basically. It's like, that's interesting. I, I've never thought about it at that moment though. Right. Because I was just a little kid and I was like, oh, I get to dance with my friends yeah. that kind of look like me. I'm trying to think, like, did I ever... Was but mostly, thing? mostly it was for my eyes, like, people doing, like, this, and mm -hmm. it was just like, ugh, it gets so old after a I while, know. and it's just like, I don't even yeah. care about those uh, people anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I just do my own thing, like, mm -hmm. hell yeah, I do have, like, slanted eyes. Asian eyes. Yeah. So. Agreed. But that was also in a very, like, I mean, for a while, we, I don't want to say that we were the only Asians, but like, we were, we though. really were, we <laughs> there was maybe another family. Pues ahí vivimos, pues, bastante tiempo, hasta que nos mudamos para Estados Unidos. Fue en el 2001, cuando nos vinimos para Estados Unidos. Yo no soy de las que me quedo, ay, no, es que tengo que estar acá en, en Inglés Paz porque acá está mi familia, no. Y ahora el trabajo de tu papá, como está en, en California, pues vamos también para allá. Digo, ahorita como estoy aquí en Austin, voy y visito a mi familia en, en Isle Paz, y ellas vienen a visitarme aquí también a Austin. Y así no la pasamos. Se me secaron todos mis árboles. Esta era una toronja, naranjo, mandarina y limón. Con el frío se me secaron todos. No sé si va a ir up, creo que va a brotar, pero está muy abajo. Yo creo que es que ellas viven en frontera y nosotros vivimos eh, pues en una ciudad. Pero aunque Igle Paz también es una ciudad, pero donde ellas viven, pues es diferente. Eh, que algo que tu papá, como él tiene otra cultura, él tenía otra cultura ya, pues ya ahora ya se hizo muy mexicano, pero... Al principio, cuando ustedes estaban todos chiquitas y pues siempre nos íbamos todas para Guerrero y 
decía él, pero ¿por qué se tienen que ir juntas? O sea, ¿por qué tienen que estar juntas siempre? Eh, este, y le decía, pues porque sí somos, o sea, tenemos, eh, o sea, así es, o sea, así es. Y cuando ya mi mamá fallece, dice él que le admiraba, ¿verdad? Que ella siempre este, le, eh, procuró porque siempre estuviéramos juntas, ¿verdad? Y que de hecho eso era algo que, que por lo que él no le gustaría regresar a vivir a Japón. Porque dice que es muy diferente. Y él dice que... que que nunca le hubiera gustado volver, o sea, con ustedes, llevarlas a vivir allá. Por eso, porque no había esa conexión como la que tenemos nosotros aquí. Yes, her family nice, always nice to me. Problem is the more uh, uh, after, after Mary, because uh, now I had to explain, she has to explain me why we had to do this one to dip together. Mexican has a, a culture to kiss, hug, uh, when you leave from a house, we don't have it. Japanese don't have it. So if I don't do that, as they believe at all, oh, this man, uh, he, he doesn't love me. Just like that one, kind of a, a, kind of a confusion and a following a dilemma. If I keep doing, a, a ignoring that a custom tradition. So that's what uh, kind of a practice that uh, you had to do it even. Oh, I, don't, I don't need to do it. I follow my culture, but uh, you had to do it. So you think Erica had a different childhood than you because of the way she looks? I think maybe you did. And the only reason why is because out of all three of us, you look a little bit more of one race mm -hmm. instead of like maybe me that kind of looks like a little weird uh so people that we grew up with they could put you in a box right because mm -hmm. when you look when somebody looks at you or at least when yeah. i look at you your features look more similar similar yeah. to uh our mexican mom so, yeah do so, you think me and you have a different childhood i think because we look more asian uh, we did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. erica said she didn't get bullied but i did too And for uh -huh. being Asian yeah, or having more Asian yeah. features. I think that's why at the beginning I was like, uh, I think I was more sh like, like ashamed mm -hmm. because people would bully, but I was also trying to fit in, mm -hmm. but yeah. I don't think that I identify with one race more than the other, even if I look a little bit more Mexican than I do Asian. But I will say that just being fluent in Spanish and not in Japanese does make me feel a little bit of an imposter. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm not saying that that is like, it takes away from like the experiences or et cetera. But I feel like there's a level of immersion that hasn't been possible because I don't know how to fully speak it. You know what I mean? Do you feel like it's like part of your identity is not there because of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like it would be so crazy if I if we did know Japanese mm -hmm. and not Spanish, then the roles would be reversed. Right? You would be... I would be more like you, yeah. I guess. And then we would be more like Erica. Yeah. Then nobody would really believe me. <laughs> But I'd, be <laughs> I'd be like, no, you ain't Mexican. Yeah. Este, por aquí seguimos. Igual no es como que gran cosa acá lo que ha cambiado. Es, estas colonias como son viejas. Realmente para aquel lado se han hecho colonias bien bonitas, nuevas, pues Muy todas bien. nuevas. Pero pues nosotros aquí en la misma colonia que Cristian dice, ya vámonos de esta colonia tan fea, él se mortifica tan. Digo, ay, hijo. No, y aparte porque pues ya les queda retirado, gorda, ya es. Mmm. Pues es que te diré, es que. 
Cris quiere que eh, eh, yo le había dicho, sí, pues nos vamos y compramos como un ranchito o algo así. Pero le digo, Cris, pues ya tenemos rancho ahí en México. O sea, ¿para qué vivir ahí? Aquí, o sea, en otro, o sea no, nos va a quedar más retirado para comprar. La última vez que pasamos el Día de Dar Gracias en Marshall, ahí no tío nos ha hecho bastantes uh, sushis de todo tipo, ah, de salmón, vegetarianos sí. para mí y para abuela porque no nos gusta el pescado. Y había dejado en un platito wasabi, pero en ese tiempo yo no sabía que era wasabi, yo pensé que era guacamole, bien mexicana. Guacamole. Se agarro el rollo y le ataco wasabi pensando que era el guacamole. Solo me lo como y no me pongo roja, roja, roja. Porque eso no pica, eso arde. Me destapó las narices. Ya sé, sí. Si te me hubiera casado con un mexicano, yo digo que te hubiera sido muy diferente en mi vida. Porque la cultura es diferente, como quiera, acá es otro estilo de vida. Es 100% diferente. Yo creo que hubiera vivido en Igle Paz, si me hubiera casado con un mexicano. It was always like straighten your hair or like people would be, when I did straighten my hair people would be like oh my god you look so pretty. I just focused a lot on trying to have my hair as straight as I could or like tied up because I didn't like it. They always said my hair looked like a nido de ratas or rat's nest. Um, they called me tishuda which means it's like a I think it's like a witch who has crazy hair and they also called me um, or they sang to me a song called despeinada like this uh-huh uh-huh and it just means like your hair is not combed like messy hair like that's what it means I didn't really have very many people to like look up to and most of my family lives in Schenectady which is upstate New York so I don't really have too many black women in my family that are near me, except for my mom and my grandmother, who my grandma has had short hair my entire life, and my mom has had long hair, which has been straightened for most of my life. So um, I didn't really know how to embrace my curly hair because no one was really talking to me about it. I would ask for it to be straightened like every weekend, and I think she would just be like, no. So I was like, I'll just do it myself. So. I think that's, that kind of caused the, me getting older and like me knowing what I wanted at that time, which wasn't necessarily like the best thing for me to straighten it every weekend, but it's what I wanted to do. So she kind of like stepped back and was like, you're going to have to learn this lesson on your own, I think. I have very, I would say stereotypical white Cuban family. 
Um, so from the jump, they would always make it seem like in order for me to look pretty or in order for me to look fina, like to look nice and put together um, for anything, my hair had to be straight. The worst day by far was August 14th, 2017. Um, and I know that day specifically because it was the day right after my dad died. I remember we went to my grandma's house because a bunch of my family had come over. And the second we got there, my grandma immediately was just incessantly attacking how my hair looked, saying that I look como una dominicana and saying that I look como una negra and all this stuff, like just berating me with all these comments. My mom would be getting me like these Brazilian blowouts and all of this kind of stuff and like promising that it would be easier to take care of, easier to manage, blah, 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 blah. And she would always be trying to get me to learn how to like straighten my hair and how to do all that kind of stuff um, because I just hated having curly hair at that time. A good hair day is usually the second day of my, after my wash day, and I usually, so like basically like my hair process usually takes two days because my I let my hair air dry, and so when I let my hair air dry, like after doing this process, I will sleep with it in like kind of a pineapple, which is like me putting all my hair up to the top of my head and then sleeping with a bonnet on. And then the next morning, I'll go in to the shower and I'll let the steam kind of get to it and it puffs it out a little bit. And it's just like the best thing ever when you get out of the shower and like that steam process actually works. Um, but you have to get it like super hot in there. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so this is where, <laughs> this is where I keep my hair stuff and like all kinds of stuff. And well, I have a lot of stuff. I have my hair gel for the edges. I have another one of these, but this one's no good. Don't buy this. I was in Mexico and I was gonna get my hair cut because my mom thought it was too long. So she took me to go get it cut in Mexico. They thinned it out and it ended up to where when I held my hair in a ponytail, like it was like so little hair and then everything was like up here. And so when I would get, <laughs> when I would go swimming, like, it would be wet when I was in the water, and as soon as I came up, it was all dry, and I looked like a lion. It was, like, it wasn't cute. Um, so usually a bad hair day is I've lost a decent amount. Oh, we got a good knot. <laughs> I've lost a decent amount um, of curl definition. And then a lot of the stuff I have in here is, like, different, like, creams, like... I have the Shea Moisture Curl Smoothie. This is from freshman year. Um, I have a bit of a hoarding problem, if you can tell. When I get out the shower, my hair is wet, but other times, like right now, when it's um, when it's a little dry, um, I make sure to wet it with like a spray bottle. Sorry, with a spray bottle, and this is the one I use. Um, yeah, so. Sometimes this isn't enough, so I'll like, I'll literally grab sink water. Um, I don't do this part every day, but when I'm trying to do like maybe a leave out or something, I'll do this. say I love my hair. It's been a long road to get to this point. Um, yeah, it's been definitely a long way of having to be like, no, like my hair is cute, or a long way to be like, you know, I don't necessarily have to chop it all off for <laughs> it to be something that I like having and all that kind of stuff. I would definitely say that um, take care of your natural hair because it's the one that grows out of your head and that's the one you're gonna be with your entire life. So appreciate it, take care of it, because it's a part of you and it grows out of you. It makes me feel confident. I feel like it expresses who I am. Like, 
if I were to have straight hair now, I, I don't feel like myself. Like, I feel weird or different. This is a love letter. A letter much overdue to this hair. My hair, a gift from my parents, the only thing that I kept besides my father's last name. And to be honest, I owe you an apology. I used to resent you, try to tame you, even burn you just to fit in. Convince myself straight was better, more put together. How silly was I to fail to see the beauty once I learned to embrace it, instead of change it. It was always there, in every kink and curl. I'm sorry it took me so long to appreciate you. But I had to learn to love myself to love you too. I promise you this, I will never try to hide you. These curls are an extension of myself. They do as they please, sitting pretty and free. And it is there where they will remain. I do think that you should be closer to me, though. Now, how is this? <clears throat> a lot better, yeah. Yeah, you think yeah. you're closer, though. Yeah, like, to me, I'm like, to me, like, it's like... with the idea of I'm going to be here and I'm going to build here and grow here. But, you know, as life would have it, things drew, kept me here, like a girlfriend, a job, and then deciding to open my own business. And this has a little bend at the nose, so it'll help see on. Well, I got mine on upside down. <laughs> Business started getting slower. And then sometime in March, I think at the beginning of the March, that other barbershops started closing. They're like, oh, in light of the pandemic or whatever they were saying, they're like, we're gonna close. And I was like, ooh, I was like, you know, I'm gonna keep going. Um, because it was already slow and it's, I just needed to ride it out. I had like a handful, a small handful, like, you know, maybe four or five people that I ended up booking within a week's time, a week and a half time. And I went to their house and did home visits. That doesn't happen. <laughs> My cousin used to say that all the time. I think it was three students. I couldn't advertise it. Because there is definitely some barbers out there that were like salty about that, you know, on Instagram or like, like, like I'm the reason the pandemic's happening and the spread's not stopping. I'm like, I'm gonna keep going. Cause like I started out this year short on money. I'm not gonna just keep digging deeper and deeper, you know? Uh, so I was like, I'm gonna try to, you know, 
dig my way out of this hole a little bit. I started my business in 2018, February. And then by 2019, I was having symptoms that were exhausting me and tiring me, and it was a quandary too. I was like, something's wrong with me. And plus I started to feel pressure, like pressure on my stomach, like somewhere around my navel. So something's not right, but I didn't have insurance. So I typed all my symptoms in to Google and what came up was uterine fibroids. I was like, what? Which is literally a tumor that's on your uterus or around your uterus or in your uterus or I don't know. I found this thing online where they were doing testing, clinical trial testing, Craigslist. So I answered the little questions, sent it in, and they emailed me back. They're like, hey, you qualify. I'm like, oh man, I do. <laughs> They're like, um, you have a uterine fibroid living at your navel that is nine centimeters, which roughly is three and a half inches. Three and a half inches? This is living in my navel. That was actually went better than I thought. Yeah, she said she's sending me a pre-op, and she's also ordering me another um, more blood work. I like her optimism. I'll tell you that much. I was thinking they weren't going to be optimistic. She said the my uh, fibroid, my tumor, covers 75% of my uterus. She said, so basically, the chances of it becoming a hysterectomy are kind of, they're pretty fair. Like, it, it could become a hysterectomy, which of course I would lose my uterus. Um, I'm not sure exactly how I feel about that. Maybe on a Wednesday I might feel pretty pissed, but on a Thursday I might be like, get it out. I don't know. I think it's pretty apparent that that I'm a company look af looked after. I'm, I'm taken care of, you know, by my creator, ancestrally, you know, the universe. But in any moment, you know, twist of fate. <laughs> that border I don't know how they did I don't know if it was I know it was in a covered wagon I don't know if they crossed water or if they crossed the road a dirt road I have no idea I came to visit my my uh, Thea and my cousin here and she told me my Thea told me that her grandma which is my great grandma was buried here and she found out that she was buried over here on Montopolis that land was purchased by like you know campesinos uh, folks from Mexico that had relocated here and lived here that felt that, you know, that Gente needed a place to be buried, that there was no place. And so they bought that land and opened it up for free for people. When we discovered that she was there, we came out right away to come see it. Oh. 
These are all things that I brought here. <laughs> As an offering. A little herbal bundle. Piece of Palo Santo. And a rock. Of some, some kind. Give what you can, right? No, um, I don't know what's happening. My results now are like, what, three weeks old now? I haven't heard anything. I try to call them, nothing. So I have to, I have to try again. But every day that I wake up, I'm not thinking about it. I'm like, this product, this, that, you know. Um, the 28th, uh, which was the gay shops, the little gay shops, grand opening. Um, it was my opportunity, in hindsight, really looking at it, it was my opportunity to really pinpoint what I'm doing here, um, what I'm after, and what my, what my goal is. I've been saying this in my head. I've been like, okay, I'm going, I'm, I'm starting a plant-based barbering movement here, um, which sounds so like it doesn't fit into barbering. It just sounds, so much like a vegan barbecue house, <laughs> you know? So I'm just like, well, you know, a lot of things didn't fit when they first happened, but now it's like you couldn't imagine them without it. It also helps me focus, you know what I mean? It helps me have a focal point of, of gratitude, um, of knowing that, you know, I'm not gonna be here that long. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop my seeds in the ground water them and get the hell out of here, you know, and hoping that somebody else will, you know, will continue my work or will see my work and appreciate it. My focus is gratitude, prayer, ancestors. Um, I'm right now trying to figure out how to like have more fun. <laughs> um, text me if you know. I need to have more fun and I get it. Like, I'm just, everything is so serious. Sometimes I feel like I'm just, I'm like, God, just burn the place down. Forget about your vision. Drive, drive, drive until you like find all the fun stuff, you know, have a cutie in the side, you know, like in the passenger side and just like all this changing the world stuff. I just want to have some fun. <laughs> 